My name's Ian Crawford. All right, and what do you, where do you work? I uh, work at Birkbeck College in the University of London in the UK, where I study planetary science and astrobiology. All right. And um, are we alone in the universe? I think we don't know whether we're alone at the universe, in the universe at the moment. You um, think we don't know or you know we don't know? No, I, well, I think we know we don't know, right? right. It's a known, a known unknown. We, we know that we don't currently know whether we're alone in the universe. And the whole science, this new science of astrobiology, is really the science of finding out whether we are alone or not. And I think we have no, well, we do have no definite answer to that question yet. And when I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? So I took that to mean life. Now, obviously, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities here from uh, life per se, which could be very simple or relatively simple, because actually I don't think any life is simple, uh, relatively simple microorganisms through to much more complicated multicellular animals to intelligent species and civilizations and technological civilizations as a whole spectrum there but the truth is we don't know whether any of that exists currently um, and so it's astrobiology's job to try and find out. You, you're using the word life as if you know what you, it means. Mm. Can you, uh, you want to... No, I, I think it's true to say there's no universally agreed definition of life. Uh, I, I came across an interesting article somewhere that was called 101 Definitions of Life or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think even the biologists have a definition that they would all universally subscribe to. Um, it's slightly unsatisfactory, of course, for a physical scientist to not have this definition because how would we know what we're looking for if we can't define it? Um, and yet there is a kind of a sense that we'd recognise it when we saw it. Now, we don't know that either yet because we haven't really seen enough of the universe. Uh, but when I used the word life, I was thinking uh, of terrestrial life, the kind of life with which we're familiar with on Earth, so that this would be a life based on uh, carbon chemistry, organic chemistry, liquid water as a, as a solvent, various organic polymers, or organic uh, macromolecules po of polymers of various kinds, uh, with, with, with all the other manifestations that we attribute to life on Earth, like its ability to reproduce and evolve through natural selection. Um, so that's kind of what I had in mind when uh, I used the word life. If you were asking me to rigorously define it, then I'd, firstly, I don't think I could, <laughs> but also I, I think I'd step back from the what's, I mean, what, what I've just given you is a kind of colloquial definition of life. It's not really a definition, it's an expectation of what we think life to be. Well, are, are viruses so, alive? So I think, obviously, if the viruses are very, a very good example. Um, viruses, in because a, a, you can make this argument either one way or the other. Um, and so, insofar as they can only reproduce with the aid of a host, then you might argue they're not autonomously able to reproduce, and so they might fail one of the definitions. Can on the other hand, on the, on the, on the, no, no, of course not. So, but then you think about it more broadly, no life can do that because we, are all, we can only reproduce because we rely on energy flows uh, from our environment. So in that case, you, you wouldn't have a good grounds for claiming that viruses are not alive. I think my take on this is it doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter. Viruses exist. They're very interesting, very complicated things. They exist in nature. Does it really matter whether we define them as alive or not? Um, I mean, if one found them on Mars or anything comparable to them on Mars, that would be a remarkable and very important discovery, whether or not you decide to claim their life or not. Well, if we found hurricanes on Jupiter, for example, the Great Red Spot, or dust devils on Mars, um, you wouldn't consider that to be life? So I personally wouldn't. Now, I'm not sure in these interviews whether you wish to be interacted with as an interlocutor, but I, I know, Charlie, you have this view that, um, and I'm moving on my chair now, I know that you have, that have this view that things like with, which uh, dissipate energy and cause local entropy to decrease or whatnot deserve to be called alive and hurricanes and volcanoes and things might even fall into that category. I never say deserve, it's just a, a broader definition uh, yes. than most people so, are used to. Yeah, so I, I personally don't think it's, I mean again, so hurricanes and volcanoes exist in nature, they're very interesting things, they're deserving of study whether or not you call them alive. I think my, my view here is that uh, if you were to broaden the term life so large as to include such structures, it almost becomes 
uh, well, not very useful, and you'd have to invent a new word for that well, subset of... Well, that's what some people would say about your broadening of life to include viruses. Yes, I know. Okay, so let's broaden it a little. How about the mitochondria in each of your cells? Are they alive? Well, clearly they once were, before they became or endosymbionts. Are they independently alive now? Well, well, you already said nothing is independently alive. No, so, so I agree. <laughs> so, so I, agree. Um, I think uh, if you look at mitochondria within cells today, they kind of fall within whatever bracket you put things like viruses in, wouldn't, they? wouldn't you? They can no longer reproduce independently because they're, well, they're dependent on the host. No, you're, you're, quite, you're quite right, nothing can. So, uh, but of course, for, for the mitochondria and the, and the chloroplasts, we know that they were once free living entities. They were once, I mean, they're derived from once free living well, entities. How about genes? So, your genes, are they, your genes inside your bodies alive? Well, again, they'd fall within a similar category because if you think, I mean, that's what virus is, really. It's just a gene with a, with a sort of protein package around it. <laughs> and then the gene goes and inserts itself into somebody so else's are, cellular they're not machine. Alive? No, so they're borderline. They're borderline. But, but, I, but I don't think, I think it's a mistake to just um, get hung up on these words. It doesn't matter whether you well, call you, it alive well, or not. Well, here, these, well, these, well, these, well, these things but, exist, but, and they, 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 they should be studied anyway, and they're very interesting. Mm. And whether you call them alive or not doesn't well, I, really matter. I don't think I'm getting hung matter. up on them. What I've been doing is when somebody insists that they're looking for life and as, a, as opposed to non-life, then it seems to me the burden is on them to know what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't think I have insisted that that's what I'm looking for. I mean, you asked me whether, whether I thought there was life in the universe, and I uh -huh. started off with what I think I'm, most people colloquially would understand life to be. And now, but digging deeper, then, then it doesn't matter. I, I, so take Mars, for example. I think we should be exploring Mars, whether or not we expect to find life on Mars. It's a very interesting planetary environment. Um, if, if it turns out that evolution or na na the natural uh, processes on the planet Mars have progressed as far as making entities that we would recognize a lot as, as being alive, then that would make Mars even more interesting. Um, but it's not that we should predicate the whole of science on just searching for life, and I don't think I said that. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm obsessed or, or con very concerned with this distinction that everybody seems comfortable with that I feel almost alone in my incredible discomfort because of uh, I, I don't think we know what life is. And, and not only that, I think that anything that has evolved cannot be defined. This is like Kant said in Genealogy of Morality, says anything that evolved cannot be defined. And that makes sense because, you know, what is it now? What was different before? Be different before, yeah. different before. And so therefore there's no definition yeah. that one can apply to an evolving thing. And if life is something that evolved, which I think you would agree it is, then you can't define it. Uh, I think I, 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 just, I would accept that up to a point. I mean, I believe very strongly that nature is a continuum, right? And so all um, processes, evolutionary processes, yes, it's been a continuous process. So you can say, here we are alive today in this room, and four billion of years ago, there were only rocks, and they're not alive, let's say. And somewhere in between, uh, complexity has, um, to use an interesting word, <laughs> and complexity in some subset of uh, natural systems has increased to the point we're happy to define them to be alive. But it, but it is a continuum, right? So you could take me up on, do x-rays exist? I mean, why, 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 why do we talk about x-rays? Why do we distinguish between x-rays and ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. and between x-rays and radio waves? when we know the electromagnetic spectrum is a continuum? Well, the, only, the answer is only for convenience. <laughs> if, we give, if, we give, if we give labels to these different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, then it's a shorthand to tell people we're talking to what kind of bit of the electromagnetic spectrum we're talking about. Is it long waves or short waves? Well, but, 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 but the spectrum itself is a continuum, and I'm sure that natural, natural selection, um, sorry, natural evolution is also a continuum, right? Nature is a continuum. So we use these words for different bits of it, really purely for our own convenience. So if we got into a time machine on Earth, and we go back to somewhere where you think there was a transition from non-life to life, we could go to, we could just say, oh, we're not in life, or you think that there would be a period of uh, 10 million years that you could say, this is when life turned into non-life? So firstly, I, I want to backtrack a little bit, uh, because it would be where in the electromagnetic spectrum our X-ray is going to turn into ultraviolet light. <laughs> and insofar as there's an answer to that question, it's yeah, a purely arbitrary. Well, 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 but that arbitrary, analogy doesn't make arbitrary. sense because no one's it's going in and saying, arbitrary. let's detect, let's go, are, we, are these X-rays, are the X-rays we see here alone in the universe? 
because we know that there's a fine continuum that everybody accepts as a continuum, yes. but in life, in non-life, they accept it as black and white. Well, I, I, I'm saying that I don't accept that. So I I, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to be boxed into a um, defending a position where I think the universe is split into life or non-life, because I don't believe that. I believe yeah. it's a continuum. But nevertheless, I can see value in using different words to describe different parts of continua, because they just provide a sort of a way of orientating ourselves in what is really an infinite continuum, to, so oh. we can kind of agree which bit of the continuum we're talking about. <laughs> okay. um, so, so, so I, I would see it that way. I wouldn't get overly hung up, overly so, hung up on the words. Okay, so then there can be things that are more alive than you are. Um, so, I, I would you put say, it in a continuum. That's yeah. What so, so I was thinking more in terms of a continuum of complexity. Um, I could certainly imagine there are things in the universe more complex than me. But saying more alive, I mean, does that, that's that, I don't think that makes sense. Even if we go back to the EM analogy, you could, it would be other things more radio wave-like than radio waves, just because they have long, longer and longer wavelengths. So I, th I still think we just get hung up on words there. Well, if you have a continuum, a one-dimensional continuum, you have a right and a left side. And if we are somewhere yeah, well, here, then there's right. something to the right of us. Yes, of course. Plausibly, well, that's to be determined. I mean, I think it would be like a continuum of complexity, right? Not only a continuum of life, but a continuum of complexity, increasing complexity through time. Only uh, always understood that we're only talking about locally, and the entropy in the whole universe has to increase and all of that, but locally, right, a continuum of increasing complexity. Well, locally means, let's say, on the planet Earth, or no, the planet they, Mars, or the but, planet... But time. there are two dis distinct X. concepts here. One is low entropy, the other is complexity. Now, which do you mean... Well, I was thinking. I was thinking in terms of uh, complexity, which is why I used the word. Okay. So, how do you define that? As a scientist, you we, you know we have to measure things. How do would you measure complexity? Oh, I, I think I've only got an intuitive sense for that. I think is, is it, <coughs> if you you define it in the number the number of independent entities that can interact, the range of possible interactions between all these different entities and, and properties that emerge from all these these you know emergent properties that emerge from in interconnections. So a, more, a greater range of interconnections of various kinds. A I greater range say. of interconnections? Yeah. Like a Rube Goldberg machine? Uh, well, I'm not really that familiar with what a Rube Goldberg machine Rube, is. but I think <laughs> there's a nut equivalent in England where somebody has a very arbitrarily complicated contraption where the ball goes here and then knocks this thing, the lever goes over here. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, well, uh, arguably something like that, except, of course, in, in living, the, the, key th the key thing to living systems is that they have to, they have to make their way in the, in, the, in the wider universe. So they have to, at each stage in the evolution of complexity, or let's say the evolution of life, then the entities have to survive. If they don't survive, they become extinct. Uh, their evolution, uh, so their evolution uh, ceases to work. So, of course, there'll be uh, in 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 the infinite space of being able to arrange different um, uh, interacting complex systems. And many of them will be dead ends because many of them there they might be very complicated. They might be too complicated. They just won't work. And so, and so they'll be selected against. So it's not kind of an arbitrary complexity. So complexity, complexity. is not a direction that our biology evolves into because of this. What you just mentioned. So I think that's, I think, I think that's partly true. I think I, I think I, let, let's backtrack a little bit. If you start off with some very simple self-replicating system that, that self-replicating. Yes. I thought you said that there was no such thing as a self-replicating system. Mm, that everything is a parasite on the host and the free energy. No, I didn't say that. I said you could think you can think of viruses or all living things as as. Are they self-replicating? So within. Within a, within a, um, so let's just a little, little backtrack here. You, you, we've got to dis distinguish between the, the sort of the world as a whole, the universe as a whole, and subsets within it. And so it's important not to keep moving the goalposts around. In, in the universe as a whole, then you cannot have complexity increasing overall because entropy has to increase overall. Locally, you can have systems. I mean, life is an, exist, is, a, is, a, is an existence proof that there are entities which locally, interacting with their environment, can replicate themselves. 
right? You and I are all living things that we're familiar with on the Earth are an existence proof that it is possible do, for, do for fires entities replicate to replicate themselves? themselves. Now, of course, they require an environment in which to do so because they can't replicate themselves without sources of matter and energy from, from the outside world. So I was taking that wider world from which these replicators draw their energy uh, and their materials from which they're made as kind of for granted leaving that in the background for the moment, then mm. given this environment, mm. of course there are self-replicating systems and life is an example of them because living things do replicate themselves. The whole ANU campus is now full of rabbits. Why is this? It is because rabbits are replicating themselves. It's so obviously living things can replicate themselves. Well, right? It's also full of pens and they have been replicated and so are pens alive? No. Why not? Because that, so again, you're pushing me to try and come to define life, which I'm not, it's not really my job to define right. life, because I already agreed at the beginning there was no universal definition of life. Right. But I think with most, most, most people would not define um, pens to be alive because they don't self replicate themselves. They are made by, usually by human beings for our own nefarious purposes, mm -hmm. but the pens themselves are not replicating themselves. But I think we've now gone so far off on this tangent, I can't remember what the original point was. Well, I, I, guess, I guess I find it interesting that as astrobiologists we're looking for life, and yet when we look at biologists on this planet, they're, they don't seem to have a definition that is satisfactory for what life is, and so therefore it kind of makes me insecure about this whole undertaking. And maybe yeah, we've already found life. Or maybe, but Elsewhere. again, does it, does it really... Matter? Yeah. I think it does. You, and do I you... mean, are you going to... If you were to decide that... Suppose we were to have a definition of life, I suppose we were to finally agree on the definition of life. I, I, so suppose we knew exactly what it was, mm. and, and therefore we knew exactly the places in the universe where it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it ceases to be worthwhile to explore these places? Well, uh, I would say that there, it's important not to have a definition of life. I think that's... Well, good, because that's where we are. <laughs> so, so, okay. so, so why, I'm not sure why we're, we're having this argument, because it's, it, we're, if we don't, have, we don't have a definition of life, and so we can, uh, it's a free, a free um, a uni universe has got um, infinite range of possibilities, a continuum of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's all interesting anyway, so we should be out there exploring it, and we shouldn't be getting overly hung up on life or not. But, but nevertheless... If you look at the continuum of complexity in the universe, we can identify within that spectrum self-replicating, given an external environment that they, they of course do rely on, self-replicating entities that are traditionally been come to be recognized as alive. And in some senses, these are some of the most interesting entities that we are aware of. And so they're well worthy of study along with the rest of the universe. And that's what astrobiology is about. Okay, so, so the question, are we alone in the universe, is it an important question? I think if, you, if, it, if it means, so, so, so you used the word we then, so when you used the word we in the question, what did you have in mind? Whatever you want, it's for you. <laughs> no, no, well, you're asking the question. No, I'm... Uh, well, the question should really be posed, um, does it, if there are complicated systems at the level of bacteria in the universe, does it matter? If there are extraterrestrial civilizations building starships in the universe, does it matter? Because there, because there is this range of possibilities. Well, I actually think all of those things matter. <laughs> so the answer to your question is, yes, it does matter. Um, but it also matters... Um, Except if you want to define hurricanes as life, then it doesn't matter as much to you. So it wouldn't... It wouldn't no, I wouldn't say it wouldn't matter as much to me. I mean, if I was an atmospheric scientist, it would probably matter more to me. I'd be more interested in finding hurricanes on... Jupiter or Mars or Alpha Centauri, some planet of Alpha Centauri or something, because 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 you know I study hurricanes. But 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 since since I'm an astrobiologist at least in part, then sort of my interest is finding things that are alive. So but that that doesn't mean that life is um, in 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 itself necessarily more important than any other physical phenomenon, except with the caveat that you can make the argument life because of its complexity and its potential, its tra transformative potential for where it, you know, environments where life establishes itself does seem to have enormous potential to transform the world around it from, from a state that it was prior to the appearance of life. So this, this I, I, I could make the case that this does make life actually of universal significance 
because of its transformative power of previously like gravity non-living environments yeah but 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 sort gravity of gravity has a transformative yes, power of course it turns does. molecular cloud yes, well, and over yes, density of course, of course it does yes but I, I i don't really want to make this this hard and fast distinction i feel you're trying to um force me to defend a hard and fast distinction between life and non-life and the importance of life and the importance of non-life and actually i don't really see a hard well, when I you know, asked you about pens, transition. you insisted that rabbits self-replicate, use the word self several times, yes. and, and to distinguish it from a pen. And yes. I, I, you keep on doing that for me, and I say, well, wait a minute, I thought okay, there was no well, hard and fast distinction here. And you say, no, it's self-replicate, as if that could distinguish. And for me, self-replicated and being replicated is, is not very much of a difference. Hmm. That's why I think memes are alive, for example. And how about hmm. the idea of memes? Do you think they are alive? No. Okay. But again, some people do. Yeah, but again, it depends. Really, it, de it depends on. It just depends on your definition of life. You can broaden life to include them if you want, but then, but then the question <laughs> is: Have you broad? Well, suppose I broaden the term X-ray to include the whole electromagnetic spectrum. It's immediately lost whatever value it had. <laughs> you might have to invent some other word what, to explain you, radio waves. No, what then. you do is invent a continuum where you can measure the things along the continuum, and that's clear yeah, but, for the wavelength of electromagnetic, yeah, but, but it's but, not but clear. But then if you're going to start using words like X-rays or gamma rays, mm -hmm. you have to define an arbitrary sure. division. But yes, and, then you get and rid so of that's the what words. words do. They sort of define. Right, right. right. But but there you're talking about a situation where you have a, a physical parameter that is a continuum, you know, the wavelength. Mm -hmm. And but in life we don't have such a easily quantified parameter that we can say, you know, like wavelength. Well, I agree. Like a, we don't yet have such a Do you think there parameter. will be one? Do you think there uh, is one? I, I, you, I you keep on using the word complexity yeah, as if it were one. Yeah, well, so there isn't one. I mean, there is. We'll go back to what I said at the beginning. There is no universally agreed definition of life that everyone will agree on. And I don't think we're going to hit upon one in this conversation. If one is ever hit upon, then I, I suspect the definition would relate to some combination of complexity, self-replication, evil. I mean, so the, the, the canonical, there is, a, of all 101 definitions of life that no one can agree on, there is the canonical one that tends to get banded around a bit by, what's his name, Joyce, what's his first name? Jerry Joyce? Gerald, Gerald Joyce, Joyce. yes. yes. Scripts, uh, life, I, so just have to see if I can remember it from the top of my head, but it's something like a self-replicating chemical, chemical system, system capable, capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution. Yes, and, I, and I think as a working definition, that's, that's quite good. I, I personally don't like the use of the term Darwinian evolution. I think if it means natural selection, it should say natural selection. But with that single caveat, a self-replicating chemical system capable of undergoing natural selection, quite happy with that as a working definition. I think it would apply to rabbits and it wouldn't apply to pens. Mm -hmm. okay. So when you say a definition, in your model for electromagnetic spectrum, it's a one-dimensional continuum. Hmm. Now, but over and over again, life versus non-life, it's not a one-dimensional thing, it's a black and white thing. It's a binary, yes or no. Well, no, I, this is what I think you, we have to get away from. And I, I honestly don't think, even if you if you sort of take Joyce's definition of self-replicating chemical system capable of undergoing natural selection, I'm not sure there's a black and white boundary yeah. implied even there, is there? Because you could, and, and clearly there cannot be, because if you go from things that we completely agree to be alive, let's say, rabbits, to things that most people would categorize, well, not all, because I know exceptions even to this statement, <laughs> that most people would classify as being um, definitely not alive, like a lump of basalt. Somewhere in between on this planet or on a planet similar to the Earth, as, a, as, 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 in, in, as, in, as geological evolution has proceeded, there has been a transition from lumps of basalt to rabbits. And it has been a continuum. And so where on that continuum you say, hmm, it's alive on this side of this line, it's not a lot of is really just a definition of life. It doesn't, nature has done what it's done. Where we put our <laughs> definitions is entirely up to us. But there's no right 
There's no other side to the rabbit. There's nothing more alive than a rabbit and less alive than basalt. Uh, I, I think... Yeah, those are the end members. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's why it's not really a spectrum of life, is it? It's a spectrum of something else. So it's a spectrum of uh, self-replicating uh, systems capable of undergoing <laughs> okay. natural selection. Okay. And, that's, and, that, and that's just we shouldn't get hung up on okay. this, the words, I think. So you and I both are ourselves astrobiologists. Why do you think it's an important question to try to find life elsewhere? Well, are we now going to agree on what life is? No, I but can't answer that question <laughs> <laughs> unless. <laughs> well, you can use whatever definition you're happy with, and then answer the question. So, I'm going to answer this question, but I'm going to fall back on what I think people colloquially understand by living systems, which is something along the lines of the Joyce definition. Um, yes, I think it's important. I think um, living systems, in this um, sense, in which I'm. I'm going to use the word life as complicated self-replicating entities undergoing natural selection um, have uh, we, we are clearly a part that that subset of entities is, that is alive we are clearly part of it we're clearly a recent development of this of this evolutionary process but we it's been going on for billions of years human beings in this case sorry yes um, so homo sapiens yes yes specifically not the genus homo so, so, so it's, it's important to know whether any of these, anything comparable exists in the universe, right? But you, you asked me whether I thought it was important. So the question is important to whom? Is it important to the universe or is it important to us? Well, I think it should be important to us and our societies because it provides a context for our understanding our place in the universe. I think there are, there are a range of possibilities, but at one end of the range of possibilities, the evolution of life may have happened nowhere else. With the, the evolution of life on Earth, the Earth might be unique in this respect in the, in the universe. Um, and if we were to discover that to be the case, that, that has a, um, have a, we have a rather lonely picture of ourselves living on this small planet all on our own, but nevertheless, we've got this worldview. On the other hand, if we discover that life is common elsewhere in the universe, or even intelligent life is common elsewhere in the universe, then our worldview changes. Now, does it matter if our worldview changes? Well, I personally think that it might, because I think our people's actions, and here we're getting into societal, right? societal and cultural realms, does it matter that people know what the universe is like, whether life is common in the universe or not? Uh, well, at some level, it doesn't matter to the universe because the universe is just as it is. But I think it can matter to us because I think it can inform our actions and decisions within our own societies. Well, I've, I've noticed that most people are not astrobiologists, and not everyone is uh, as obsessed or concerned with the, how, wondering how we fit into the universe. And uh, so, I, I'm not sure who was I'm it, Plato sure. who said that uh, the unexamined life is not worth living? Uh, I don't know. It might have been. So you think, do you think the unexamined, I mean, if you think that the cosmic perspective is so important, that means people who completely ignore this cosmic perspective their whole life, their life is not as important as we no. self-examining types? No, I certainly didn't say that. <laughs> um, but I think um, if we to look at the, the societal, does, does searching for life in the universe and the possible whether we find life or not, does, they, does that have societal implications, and I think, yes, it probably will have, um, regardless of whether, well, again, it depends, right? So, so if a spaceship comes and lands on the ANU campus tomorrow morning, that's, uh, we're, we're, we're a, huge, um, a huge change, I think, to the focus of social and political systems, religious systems around the world. If we discover that there are microbes on Mars, then clearly not so much. Most people already think there are microbes on Mars, even if we don't know whether there are or not. It doesn't affect their lives um, in any direct way, so it's unlikely to have any great social or political or religious consequences on the Earth. So I guess the, 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 the scale of the effect, uh, the socio-political effect of discovering life in the universe, will depend on what that life is, what, what we actually discover, and whether it's microbes or civilizations flying around in spaceships. But regardless of that, there is another, there is another level of answer to the question, is it important, right? So 
whether it's important to the man in the street, yes, it could be. If there are aliens out there in spaceships landing in, at the Australian National University, or with clear tremendous potential to interfere with our existence, should they wish to do so. Um, or whether it's just microbes on Mars with, uh, with less, 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 less implications for the, the average person who isn't interested. But then, of course, as scientists, then it, 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 it interests us anyway because we're interested in what, what the universe is, what's going on in the universe, and so it becomes important to us to know whether life is a um, major part in the fabric of the universe, a major player, or not. Now, you've seen the movie Contact, I guess. Yes, a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in the movie, several times, the question is asked, are we alone? And the answer comes back, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. What do you think of that response? I'm not very satisfied with that. So there I assume we is referring to technological life forms or sort of... I think that's right. Sort of extraterrestrial civilizations rather than, rather than microorganisms. Would it be a tremendous waste of space? I think that... <laughs> now, I'm not happy with this argument. It kind of implies that, you know, space has a purpose and the purpose is to make t <laughs> advanced civilizations. And so if there aren't many advanced civilizations in the universe, that some, most of the universe might as well not exist and it's all a waste of space. Um, I, I, th I think it's the wrong way to, to view it, isn't it? I think... The, the universe is, uh, is, is, is as it is. The probability of evolving life and, and the probability of evolution, natural selection, producing complicated civilizations, intelligent life, is what it is. We don't know what that probability is yet. Uh, but it might be very small. And if it was very small, you'd need a lot of space in order to have one example appear within, you know, within some period of time, like the Stellariferous period, if you're going to rely on stars and planets, then you've got to form your intelligent life form in, I don't know, several, within, within a few 10 billion years or something. And if the probability of, of forming intelligent civilizations was really low, uh, you would need a lot of space to, in order to get just one example. Could it be zero? Well, it clearly isn't zero, because here we are. So it could be really very small, do you think it's larger than the probability of aliens speaking English language? Do I think it's uh, do I think the probability is larger than that? Well, yes, because whatever the probability of aliens is, that might be small, but then you've got some small number of aliens. Uh, then the probability of any one of them speaking English is obviously um, very small, even smaller. So <laughs> a lot smaller. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so it's negligible, isn't it? But then, if the universe was infinite, then then of course. <laughs> If, if the universe is infinite, then anything's, anything's, everything, will, everything's, everything will happen. So but you don't think there's many things that are sets of measure zero, or probability zero? Um, that's a very uh, difficult question to answer, isn't it? I mean, I think if you really pushed a quantum physicist, they would say, yeah, everything has some probability. <laughs> anything, however unlikely, is going to have some finite probability. Um, but we're not, we're not kind of in that realm, I think. Well, we're talking, we're talking about the evolution of intelligent life forms then, and then what languages they might speak if they evolve. We're well, kind of well, there's a metaphor. You say, imagine you had an infinite basket full of ping pong balls, like in a lottery, and there's an infinite number of them in them. And then what do you do? You pull it in your hand and pull out one. The probability yeah. of that one is zero Maybe, because there's yeah. an infinite number well, of them. Well, it's not zero. Still, oh, well, if there was an infinite number. Yeah, yes, an infinite number, yes, and yes, you pull okay. out one, there it is. Yes. So it happened, there it is, but its probability was zero. Yes. So couldn't life be like that, or couldn't intelligent life be like that? Couldn't um, it be that quirky? Uh, I'm not happy with this analogy, because of course you can't, it's a non, in practice, you can't have an infinite number of ping pong balls. Can you? you can just have an arbitrarily large you number. You can have an infinite out. number of positions for an electron between here and here. Yes. And therefore that electron, the probability of being where it is is zero. Yeah, well that's why I sort of, Told you, if we're having a quantum physics discussion, things might be different. <laughs> well, I'm just I, trying to figure I, out when it, when it when it comes. So, look, I think let, let's back <laughs> let's backtrack. We don't we we do know that it is possible for life to arise from non-life because it's happened once, and we know at least once that we know of, 
and we know that, that doesn't it, mean the probability no, no, is no, not no, zero. No, 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 just carry on. And we know that given, given, given the, the, the origin of such life, we know that it is possible, the probability is non-zero for it to evolve after some billions of years into intelligent life because, well, what we're pleased to call intelligent life because we know it's evolved into us. We, I think we do know those probabilities are non-zero because it's happened at least once. Well, wait, well, let me push back on that. You take the rational numbers between zero and one, and you, there's an infinite number of them, and you have an infinitely sharp knife, and you go, boom, I'm picking out one. Whatever it is you pick out, that probability is zero. And so it happened, it's there, but its probability was and is zero. And yet there it is. Or it goes from zero to well, one just because it, so why isn't that a legitimate un way of assigning a probability to you or English or aliens elsewhere? Well, I think it makes a mockery of probability theory, doesn't it? A mockery. In, 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 in any, in any sets of measures zero make a mockery of normal uh, thinking about probability. I mean, statistically, the, the sensible. I mean, leaving leaving quantum weirdness. Aside, this is not quantum weirdness. This is a rational numbers embedded in real numbers. Yeah. Okay. And we but, use but real numbers usually, all the time. It, 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 yeah, 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 okay. But we've, we're talking about, if, if we restrict us, I think, I will, I, will come, I will defend the position that you can't, if something exists, then its probability it's of existence non is non-zero. Because okay. otherwise I don't see the, you're, def, you're changing the definition of, to make it otherwise, you're changing, the, again, changing the definition of probability to something that it doesn't really, like, no, no, no. doesn't People really who study sense. probability are well aware of sets of measure zero and probability zero, that's not foreign to them. Yeah, right, but it and is things, to uh, most things people. Still, uh, things, if, if you're going to have things still happen, that with which we have a probability of happening of precisely zero, then there's a contradiction there, which suggests to me that the, the use of the word probability is being used in a slightly different sense. Okay. Um, but 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 anyway, if we use the word probability in the sense that I think is generally generally <laughs> accepted. <laughs> the fact, the fact, the fact that life exists in the universe mm. because we have at least one example means that the probability is non-zero. But the probability may still be extremely small, right? Because it may only have happened once but non -zero. in the observable. And universe. the same thing for English. Uh, yes. The same thing for this conversation. Yes. So if the universe is infinite, this conversation is happening an infinite number of times yeah, yeah, elsewhere in the universe. Uh, presumably so, if the universe okay. is strictly infinite. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think we're into a realm... So you think that the, there are an no, infinite number of conversations like this... No, I am very um, a bit doubtful of, of, of that. Spatial infinity. I'm infinity. very doubtful that the universe is actually literally infinitely large. But if we but, do take that as a hypothesis, that, and that's consistent with the data that we now have from cosmology, then there, you think there are an infinite number of this thing going on right now uh, in the universe. Well, Not I, only a lot, I, I, I don't but an want infinite to, I think you're slightly trying to put words into my mouth. I, I don't want to say that I think this is happening. I think if the universe were to be literally, literally infinite. Spatially it, infinite? Yeah. Yes, spatially infinite. Then? But then, well, then you've got to worry about whether it's literally, temporally infinite or not. I think if it were spatially infinite, but it's got a finite age, then yes, if it was spatially infinite, then we, given that given that in ten, given in thirteen billion years, we this is evolution can clearly clearly proceed to the extent that it's happened on the Earth, and here we are in this room after thirteen billions of years. So if if the universe were literally infinite, then a similar, exactly analogous situation must be arising. And presumably, if it's literally infinite, not only arise not only not only two of us. Two pairs of conversations, but infinite pairs That's of right. conversations. So you, but so I'm not. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to get. I think we're, we're into a sort of a kind of metaphysical. Well, it's not thought, metaphysical thought, thought in the sense that cosmologists yeah, 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 take that idea not, very seriously. Yeah, but let's get back to astrobiology, right? Well, we're I think, talking about I think the probability of things. Life in the, so I think. I think in order to have any sort of sort of sensible discussion about probabilities of life in the universe, <laughs> okay. we should at the very least be restricting ourselves to our observable horizon within the universe, right? And that's not infinite. Because we can have no knowledge, in principle, as far as I know, we okay. can have no knowledge of what's going on okay. beyond, the, beyond, the, beyond the horizon of the observable universe. So speculating about it, yeah, you can put it in the same category as other universes within the multiverse, or multiverses within a bigger multiverse. Or you can have all of these, all these possibilities, and they, they, may be, um, they may be real for all I know, but they're beyond our ken, and they probably always will be beyond our ken. So from a practical consideration of searching for life in the universe, we should really be restricting ourselves to the observable universe. So, so let's say we had a prob we could figure out the probability of intelligent life, and it was um, 
it was small enough that we should, would not expect it to be in our observable universe, but it was large enough so it would be in beyond our observable universe. Let's say we, could, we knew that. Would we be alone or not? Well, effectively. <laughs> okay, effectively. I think that's all you can say, isn't it? Right. Because you could, you could raise the question, suppose there was a multiverse, and the multiverse has an infinite number of universes yeah. in it, and there might all be infinitely big. And are we alone or not? Well, in one sense, no, there are all these multiverses. But, but, in, but in another sense, then, in since we can have no knowledge of them, we can't prove the existence of life in these multiverses, we can't communicate with them, then effectively, I mean, it's an interesting philosophical, if you don't like the word metaphysical, it's an interesting mm -hmm. philosophical discussion, right? It's a bit like how many angels can you have dancing on the head of a pin, right? Well, we could ask but, whether but, the but, universe but, is alone. And, and scholastic philosophers in the Middle Ages got really hung up on this question, right? If God's are omnipotent, can he make it? How many angels can you? Yeah, but it's a nonsensical. It's not. It's not nonsensical. You can formulate it. How many? How many angels can God have dancing on the head of a pin? But it's just not. It's just not for practice. For practical point of view of us as scientists trying to understand the universe. It's not really helpful. On the other hand, the observable universe, I'll, I'll come back to this if I may, because within the observable universe, we can make progress here because it is, although we do not know the answer, we don't know whether the probability of evolving life on a planet like the Earth, or a planet like the Earth was four billion years ago. We don't know whether that probability is about one, like Frank Drake used to think that it probably still does think that it is, or whether it's, whether it's really small. But we can find out, because we can address this empirically, right? We can start exploring the universe, identifying planets that were like what the Earth was like four billion years ago, and then we can see, do they all, does, has life appeared on all of them? In which case, F subscript L in the Drake equation is about one. Well, or, assuming... or, or suppose we, we, we examine a thousand of them, and, and none of them have life, despite the fact they were like what the Earth was like when life arose mm -hmm. here, then, then that's pushing you to think that F subscript L is somewhere like 10 to the minus 3. So we can address this empirically, but it requires us to get out into the universe and explore it. We can address it empirically if you think the results of our searches can unambiguously tell us whether there oh, is or is not so, life. So there. sorry, that's a different and very interesting and important question, but it's different. Um, yes, of course, it depends on our, our capabilities. Um, now, if you're going to ask me... No, whether I was thinking about whether it, de it depends on whether the spectrum between life and non-life... Oh, well, it depends on that as well. Yeah. Of course, it does depend on our definition. Yes, well, of course. Well, for example, let's suppose that we search a thousand planets and everywhere we see things that we were kind of saying, well, that's not really life, it's not really non-life. Let's suppose we did that. And again yeah. and again, we came up with things that, oh, well, that's not life, that's not real... If we kept on going into ambiguous situations like that, then what would that wouldn't that tell us? Hey, you know, your definition of life is so local it doesn't apply. To yes, it would tell us that, and that would be a really interesting result in and of itself. It would tell us that. You think that's a possibility? Yeah, of course it must be a possibility because you know, the universe, even our, with even in our local universe, which isn't spatially or temporally infinite, it, the, the, the space of possibilities. It's probably a lot of uh, possibilities for the way matter can organise itself. It's probably a lot bigger than anything we've yet thought of. Well, there so I, I think I think we should we should be absolutely be prepared to to um, expect the unexpected. Okay, let me ask you another question. That is, uh, what is your favourite solution to Fermi's paradox? So, are we to take for granted that your viewers know what Fermi paradox is, mm -hmm. or should yeah, I? Let's take that for granted. Okay, right. So. I, the, the Fermi paradox is something that very occasionally does keep me awake at night, uh, or literally sometimes. Um, my favourite theory, until quite recently, was that if you look at the, the probabilities of um, uh, evolving life and life becoming intelligent and all that, if you look at the probabilities in the, in the Drake equation, my favourite uh, theory until relatively recently was that F, subscript i is small. Um, like I, would, I would be happy to have f subscript l to be about no, Wait, could you find, define those terms? Oh, sorry. So the Drake equation uh, takes the, uh, the uh, is an attempt by Frank Drake to try and estimate the number of extant civilizations in the galaxy at any one mm -hmm. time. And he did this by taking the uh, rate at which stars form and multiplying this by a whole string of fractions. The fr fraction F subscript P is the, uh, the fraction of these stars that have planetary systems. 
and then a whole other, other fractions, including the fraction that these planets will have life, or the fraction that such life will become intelligent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, th then this, 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 this is then multiplied by the lifetime of the extant civilization, presumably the average lifetime, if you're thinking of many of them. And this will give you an indication as to how many civilizations exist in the galaxy at any one time. Now, until quite recently, I took the view that life appeared on the Earth probably as soon as the Earth's surface environment could support life. So we've got fossil, fossil evidence for life going back to at least 3.5 and probably 3.8 billion years. And the planet's only 4.5 billion years old. Our geological record has run out anyway. And yet in the earliest rocks we've got, we've got evidence for life. So this kind of implies that life was present on the Earth very early, uh, arguably as soon as the Earth's surface environment was habitable. And this could imply that, although we don't know how life forms out of non-life, nature knows how to do it, and it happens pretty quickly on planets like what the Earth was like 4.5 billion years ago. Um, and I've, I've, I accepted that argument for a long time. But then we've got the Fermi paradox at the other end, is that we don't see, we don't see a lot of intelligent civilizations in the galaxy, so uh, at least not yet. Now, there are all sorts of interesting questions, right? They might be hiding and everything, so we'll leave part of that. <laughs> um, so... If, if, it, if we don't have a lot of technological civilizations in the galaxy, but life is common, then some of these other fractions in the Drake equation must be low. And until relatively recently, I thought the probability of forming complicated multicellular life forms was probably the bottleneck. And I had in mind things like the endosymbiotic events that caused mitochondria to be incorporated into early eukaryotic cells and then animal life is completely dependent on these and yet incorporating an endosymbiont into a cell isn't something that can really evolve by natural selection it's a chance event and once it's happened if it's beneficial it can be selected for but it's certainly not inevitable so i i i, I, I until recently took the view that that was the solution i'm now much less sure I'm beginning to think that maybe the origin of life itself, so right at the beginning of the Drake equation, the fraction of Earth-like planets or habitable planets on which life actually arises might actually be really low. Um, yet it could still be a combination of all of these things. The probability of evolving life from non-life might be very low. The probability of this life be evolving complexity to a eukaryotic level might also be very low, and you multiply all these very low probabilities together and you get not very many intelligent civilizations at the end. So that's my current feeling. But I just, I just, want, to, just want to stress that the, this is something that we can address empirically. We don't have to just have our favorite solution to the Drake equation and believe it as an article of faith. Uh, we can address it, right? Because if the fraction of Earth-like, fraction of planets that are like what the Earth was like four billion years ago, if, if life evolves commonly under such environments, then it leads us to predict that life would have evolved on Mars. It probably would have evolved on, well, Europa is a bit different, but certainly should have arisen on Mars because that was an Earth-like environment Venus. a long time ago. Arguably early Venus, that would be diffi more difficult to <laughs> access. Um, and, and of course, planets like what the Earth was like four billion years ago are going to be very common in the galaxy. We're now turning up so many Earth, Earth super-Earth type planets in habitable zones, which means that these planets like what the Earth was like then, by, by which I mean rocky planets, a lot of basaltic, igneous rocks, liquid water, carbon dioxide atmospheres, these planets are going to have been really common. And so if life really evolves quickly and easily from non-life under those conditions, then microbial life, at least, is going to be very common. It's going to have evolved on Mars, even if it's now dead. It's going to exist on many rocky planets around other stars. And we can, we can address that. We can certainly go and dig up Mars, and, and, and less easily. We can probably develop the astronomical techniques to see whether life has appeared on rocky planets around other stars. So, so, so just, I know I'm not having a long answer here, but just, just before I let you get in, I think within the next um, several decades certainly within the next 50 years, I think we will know, empirically, we will know whether the limiting factor in the Drake equation is the fraction, F, F subscript L, the fraction of warm, wet, rocky planets on which life evolves, because we can address it by exploring our own solar system, and we can address it by looking for biomarkers in the atmospheres of nearby exo 
planet. So let me summarize what I think you said. You said the, your previous favorite was F sub I, that was the bottleneck. Yes. But then you switched to F sub L. Yes. And can I accuse you of switching to F sub L not because of data, but because you felt that it was more empirically testable? Mm, I think it is empirically testable. I know that, but um, the question is, I'm, but I'm I, accusing I, you of switching because no, of its empiricism. No, I, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I've switched because as I've tried to learn more about biology, uh, uh, the more impressed I am, I say you're not going to like this word, <laughs> the more impressed I am by the sheer complexity of even the simplest prokaryote. If you look at the, the, the array of really complicated macromolecules that are required to keep even the simplest life functioning, then it's, um, I can imagine it's quite difficult to evolve this from non-living or much simpler geochemical well, Let me get this straight. But, 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 F sub L and F sub I. When you said F sub I, you then mentioned endosymbiosis, but I was thinking of human-like intelligence. Yeah. Uh, so there no, is yeah, but that's because, this is because of the way Drake formatted his equation. He has nothing between L and a, I. L and I. I so everything you think intelligence depends on, <laughs> right. the, the, but, but, but uh, other than life itself, mm -hmm. which is F sub I, sorry, F sub L, Everything that your intelligence depends on, you have to fit it in F sub i, and that's just a limitation of the Drake equation. But because intel even given eukaryotic multicellular life, the evolution of intelligence of eukaryotic multicellular life might itself be very low. So if I gave you a hundred billion dollars, with the caveat you have to spend this money to try to answer, to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? A hundred billion dollars. I think for a hundred billion dollars, I'd be investing in a, um, a aggressive Mars exploration program to determine whether or not life arose on Mars uh, at about the same time it arose on the Earth. Because Mars 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago would have been a much more similar environment to what the Earth was at the same time. So currently the planets have diverged a lot, largely because of life on Earth. But at that time, you'd have uh, the both planets would have been covered in basaltic crusts, a lot of active volcanism, a lot of liquid water, uh, dominantly carbon dioxide atmospheres. Life did arise under those conditions on the Earth. If F subscript L were about one, it predicts that life would have arisen on Mars at the same time. It might now be extinct. So finding evidence for this early life will be hard. But $100 billion dollars is within the ballpark that you could mount a Mars exploration um, program with that might help you find out whether life was on, whether life existed on early Mars. What about the, would you invest none of it in SETI? Well, SETI isn't very expensive. I think SETI, I, 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 these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, we should absolutely be continuing with SETI because the fact we haven't discovered any signals yet doesn't mean we never will. And SETI isn't very expensive. I mean, it becomes expensive if you have to start building dedicated telescopes. So of your 100 but, billion, you'd give a billion to SETI? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what SETI requires. I think SETI's actually doing all quite all right at the moment. I'm sure the more it has, anyway, the better the more, it would the more, do. Right, the, well, uh, yeah, so, uh, so none of these things, are, and it's a, I think it's a mistake to see these things as mutually exclusive. I'm not um, saying mutually I'm just saying, hey, but, how are you going to divide up your 100 billion? Um, but I, I think... If you wanted to me to, yeah, but but with a caveat, I to 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 see whether how how what was the what was the hundred billion for to see to whether help life answer is, the question are we alone? Yeah, again, uh, slightly it depends on what we. If if you pose that question to someone who took we to mean a technological civilization, mm -hmm. yeah, you wouldn't be bothering with Mars. You probably would mm -hmm. be building yeah. SETI. Um, if you take it to just be life as life, whatever Damn, that is. Much then I think for that kind of order of magnitude investment, uh, finding out what was going on on early Mars is probably the most important thing well, we well, could let's do. Say, let's but say I say SETI, we should be carrying on SETI in, in parallel, of course, absolutely. So half your money is going to go to SETI? I, I don't think SETI requires to... These, I mean, my understanding of SETI is it's becoming... Um, it's, all, it's developing a lot of very sensitive um, uh, multi-channel... Uh, detectors that can now analyze lot, really very large areas of the, electromagnet the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
uh, simultaneously at high frequency rate re resolution. So all it really needs to spend a lot of money on is building more of these detectors and putting them onto big telescopes. And it's only going to need billions of dollars if it starts to require building dedicated telescopes. But so my, my understanding here is there's a lot of work's been done on piggybacking these detectors mm -hmm. on things like SKA and other, other large detectors where you actually you let the radio astronomers just do their radio astronomy thing and the SETI people just feed off, take a bit of the feed and search it for signals and, uh, and eventually... So what they'll... fraction? You're going to give them one or two billion dollars then? Out of your hundred? <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea how much money would be make a Make a, in order to make an order of my, I think I think usually when, when you think about investing in scientific infrastructure, you, you kind of the question is always what does it take to make an order of magnitude improvement? Because if you're going to have a, a, a just factor two improvement, then it's hardly worth doing. You might as well just spend doing doing what you were doing, but twice as long. So you, you're really looking for like an order of magnitude improvement in sensitivity. I honestly don't know what it would take financially to increase the efficiency of current SETI searches by an order of magnitude. I do think, yes, it would be worth doing. How about, would you invest any money in electron microscopes to look for nano aliens? Um, not at this time, I don't think. Okay. Now, now <laughs> do we have any you, evidence for nano have, aliens? Now, of course, a, they may be. They may be. They may be crawling around this room for all we know. We have no evidence on you them. You have billions say. of neurons in your head. Yes. I think none of them know that they're part of you. I imagine Could that's we true. be part of an alien and not know it? Kind of like the Truman Show. Well, I think in principle, yes. How would you tr test that? I don't know. I mean, that's almost like the simulation argument, in a way. How right. do we know whether we were living in a simulation? Do you have any answer for that one? No. No, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, some people talk about humans being unique. What is your view on that well, opinion? Again, it depends on what... Yeah, it does depend on what you mean by unique. Um, unique on Earth or unique in the universe. I mean, clearly on this planet at the present time... Yeah, I think we're unique. Aren't all species unique? Yes, they are. So, so I think you would only say that we're, we're, we're kind of... What hasn't... What arguably hasn't happened in the history of life on Earth yet, until, until relatively recently, is a single species has managed to essentially dominate its flows, available flows of mass and energy and use the whole planet's resources to its own pur for, the, for its own purposes, for a single species, uh, which is kind of what we're on the verge of doing, and it leads to this whole Anthropocene. Now, now you could argue that you go, you go back to about three billion years ago, yes, the cyanobacteria, they completely changed our planet, they gave it an oxygen atmosphere. Obviously, they were unique <laughs> at the time. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Are we, um, okay. does, it, does, it, does it matter? Uh, well, in 1995, Ernst Mayer and Carl Sagan had a debate about the likelihood of human-like intelligence evolving. Oh. Many people who do SETI just assume that once you have life, you get technological yeah, well, intelligent that's... life. And so do you have a view on the likelihood of, let's suppose that there's life everywhere in the universe, what do you think is the probability of that life becoming technological to make space I, ships I and think telescopes? I think it's low. And, why, I, and I think, well, I think, insofar as we've got any evidence at all, we've got the implication of the Fermi, the so-called Fermi paradox. We don't see any evidences for these technological civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally have come to the view that if, if they'd been really common, not just common now, but common over the history of the galaxy, then things would have happened which we would either know about or things would have happened which would have precluded our own appearance, our own evolution. Um, so I, my personal take on it is I think intelligent life is rare. But I have no evidence for this other than the, what I see as the implications of the Fermi paradox. And this is why it is important to look. Right? It's important why it's to keep... SETI hasn't discovered anything in 50 years, but SETI is getting more and more sensitive. And so there are good reasons for continuing with SETI and making it more and more sensitive to get better limits on the prevalence of radio transmitting civilizations in the galaxy. And so I think we should keep looking. 
Uh, but my own personal expectation at the moment is we're probably not going to find much evidence for technological civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy. Are you aware of um, Alfred Russell Wallace's book, uh, Man's Place in the Universe? Yes. So, so Wallace, obviously, a very interesting person, not least because he was there at the very beginning of evolutionary biology because he had the same idea that Darwin had um, about natural selection. But in, in about 1903 or thereabouts, he wrote this book, Man's Place in the Universe, which is kind of maybe the first astrobiology book uh, in a way. And he argues in there uh, that the probability, he, he argues that life might be common, but he argue, he's got this wonderful phrase, I don't think I can remember verbatim, um, the probability, but something like the probability of evolving man or a comparable moral and intellectual being will be uh, one part in a hundred million million. So he thought it was very unlikely. Now, obviously, that's a complete guess. He thinks it's very unlikely. Let's say it's 100 million. Let's, let's say it's one point 100 million million. The thing is, well, that, that's equivalent to putting F subscript I as, as equal to 10 to the power of minus 14 in the Drake equation. So he and said then, mor sorry, what was the, he said moral Yeah, uh, man, the, the, the probability of evolving man or an equivalent moral and intellectual being. Moral, so... Will be one part in a hundred million million. You don't think insects are morals then? No, no. So he was... Th these were, this was like his, his equivalent. You're asking whether, 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 he, whether, whether Homo sapiens is unique. Um, and he was thinking the probability of having anything comparable to Homo sapiens. This was his equivalent moral and intellectual being. You don't have to think that humans are moral, especially, but <laughs> equivalent to what to what humans are, right? Well, the, what the do evolution... you think does the probability of a sulfur crystal? No, no, no. Yeah, so, so I'll just I'll just carry on this train of train, train of thought for me. The um, the probability of evolving a uh, an equivalent man, evolving man through natural selection. Remember, he was a co-discoverer of the principle of natural selection. Mm -hmm. So he was aware, he'd come to think about all these bottlenecks, the difficult, the evolution, all the different things you've got to do. And the fact that each one might be, have a low probability, and you have to multiply all these probabilities. So he ends up with this statement, the probability of evolving man or an equivalent moral and intellectual being, his phrase, would be uh, 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 one part in 100 million million, which is 10 to the power of minus 14. It's very interesting, you stick, if you, now it's guess, it's your pure guess, but it's very interesting to take Wallace's guess so, and put it into the Drake equation, and suppose, you know, everything else is one, like Frank Drake likes to believe. The star, oh, star formation rate in the galaxy probably is about one. But then all planets, all stars are planets. We now know that's about one. Even if the probability of life evolving on those planets is about one, one times one times one times one, but, but your, your F subscript I well, what was somewhere in the region of what Wallace thought it would be, 10 to the minus 14, Suddenly, you've got how many civilizations are there in the galaxy? The answer is 10 to the minus 14 times L. Suppose the average lifetime was a thousand years. How many civilizations in the galaxy are there? 10 to the minus 11. So, what does that mean? It means you've got to survey 10 to the 11 galaxies to find one. And so, we're it in the observable universe. So, if Wallace was right that, that evolving simple life to intelligent life was anything like his guesstimate, as 10 to the power minus 14, we're expect, we, we would then expect ourselves to be the only technological civilization in the observable universe. Uh, and that, for better or worse, is consistent <laughs> with our observations to date. Now, is, on this point, isn't this where Darwin and Wallace parted ways? Well, I don't think Darwin ever really got into thinking about how common life was elsewhere in the universe. I don't think he, they would have parted ways on... Well, I thought Darwin thought that man, just like every other creator, was a result of natural selection. Yes. And I thought that Wallace wanted to put man somehow in a different yeah, category. Yeah, no, no, you're right. So Wallace did. So Wallace is, um, Wallace, it, it is true. We're going to get on to the history of uh, Wallace. He, uh, he, he did have a quasi-religious view. He did think it was a spiritualist view, which was all the rage in late Victoria and England. He did have the view that that man was somehow different from the rest of the natural world. That is true, whereas Darwin did not. So there was a there is a distinction between the two of them there. Yes. He also wanted to put the sun at the center of the galaxy. Well, I think that's less. I think that's more. That's, that's, that's less of a sin. <laughs> well, given given the state of astronomical knowledge at the time, 
Um, now it's true, of course, that Herschel had already kind of sort of sort of shown that probably the sun wasn't at the centre of the galaxy by then. So, so you're right. I mean, it is tr perfectly true that Wallace was in part motivated by a desire to see man as uh, special in some sense. Well, let's let's play a little game that some biologists play. Let's go back, let's say, to the Cambrian explosion. That's about 500 million years ago. We're going to replay the tape of life. What do you think would happen on Earth? Do you think anything like human beings or technology would evolve again? Um, well, I think those are different, different, different questions. I think, I know, I don't, I don't think that anything like human beings would evolve again, or, or not, not, not certainly not. You, I don't, you would not. I don't believe. So I'm with Stephen Jay Gould on this. I don't think if you, if you were to replay the tape of life, I don't think we end up with um, you and me sitting in the same office in the same. <laughs> well, how uh, would you end up with something that was doing astrobiology with, yeah, the, with so the that's, radio um, telescope? That's a different question. I, th I think, and again, you've got to... Well, Carl Sagan the, the, would say it's the same question because he was talking about functionally equivalent human beings. Yeah, yeah. And by that, I think he meant anything that had a camera and a telescope and microscope and was looking at a cosmic perspective of itself, trying yeah. to understand itself. So I think, I, I, th I suspect the answer to that must be no. Um, but again, all I can appeal to is the Fermi paradox. If the answer to that was yes, then since planets like what the Earth was like four billion years ago are going to be really common, unless the origin of life itself has a very low probability, if you grant, the, if you grant that life is likely to appear on these planets, then life is very common. So if sort of convergent evolution was always going to lead to intelligence, that would immediately force you to think that intelligence is going to be common and we don't see it. Now, maybe, I mean, maybe reasons why we don't see it other than it's not there. I mean, it might be hiding, it might be extinct, it might... But still, if, if, if intelligent life, given how transformative life can be, and intelligent life particularly, if it had become really common in the universe, you might think we see it well um or arthur evidence c. for it arthur c clark present. said any sufficiently advanced technology yeah, will be indistinguishable from, from, magic. Yeah, from yeah. magic and then carl schroeder said arthur you're wrong any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature mm -hmm. and that would make it harder to see if you're yeah, indistinguishable from nature so do you think that uh, schroeder is right about that could that be a solution to fermi's paradox that these advanced civilizations don't go out and make parking lots and send out large signals. Rather, they become sustainable tree-hugging. Uh, yeah, of course it could. Be. Of course it could be. I think we have to keep an open mind here. I mean, and this is really why we're only going to get to the bottom of this uh, by addressing these questions empirically. We're going to have to get out into the universe and look. But the empirical, and, and then we'll find the empirical out what's test going on. depends but, on a distinction between natural and artificial. Uh, 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 and what I just suggested is there is none. No, but it, yes, it, yes, it does. So, so up to up to a point. But I think if intelligences were common, um, then you have to almost any solution to the Fermi paradox that ex that, that accepts intelligent technological life is common. Um, but we still don't see it, is kind of forced to assume that it will all evolve in the same way. All civilizations will evolve in a way that we're not going to be able to detect them. I.e. none of them would be doing things like moving around in spaceships or blowing up planets or building Dyson spheres. Or, and, and this, doesn't, this isn't, doesn't, isn't plausible. If, if the world, if the, if, suppose there'd been, if there'd been like two or three civilizations evolve in the history of the galaxy, then plausibly you could imagine that two of them might have become extinct because they destroyed themselves and one of them is, is camouflaging itself in nature and it's all around us but we don't know about it. That's a zoo hypothesis. But if a million technological civilizations had arised in, in the history of the galaxy, there will be a spectrum of motivations and a spectrum of activities. And some of that, some, some end of that, so a Gaussian distribution basically, the probability of our being able to detect them. And there'll be some that, yeah, we hiding, they're well hidden, we won't be able to detect them. But the more civilizations you've evolved in the history of the galaxy, the greater the number are going to, you would think, the greater the probability that some of them would be doing things that we 
we would have noticed. And I think this is the strength of the Fermi paradox to me, that, 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 that there is no Fermi paradox if you think n is small. If n is half a dozen, I can think of lots of reasons why we haven't noticed half a dozen technological civilizations in the galaxy. But if n were to be a million, as people like Sagan and Drake used to advocate for, then it seems to be implausible to me that some, some small fraction of that million wouldn't be doing things that we would notice. Are you, re are you restricting the number n to our galaxy or well, I was our there. observable universe? Uh, I was thinking in terms of, the, when I was thinking of hiding half a dozen civilizations, I was thinking of hiding them in the galaxy. Was there any but scientific reason for that? Because no. galaxies are very close to each other. Yeah, no, none at all. Okay. It's just that the, 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 the normal form, the way people normally approach it through the Drake equation is he starts off with the formation rate of stars in the galaxy, and then you but know the, you could multiply that by ten, and you could talk about the local group. <laughs> it doesn't really call multiply. Or you could talk about the entire universe. You could, yes, multiply it by ten to the uh -huh. twenty-two or something. I, I don't know, but yeah. Now the the idea of trying to understand how we fit into the universe, and we're asking this question as if it's an important question. We both think it's an important question. Do you think, let's suppose that we found out or we find out more and more about that. Does that somehow make us more self-conscious or does that make us better people? Does that make us, what does it make us if we find, as Carl Sagan once said, humans are the universe's way of becoming aware of itself. Mm. As if becoming aware of itself is much better than just doing photosynthesis or you know eating, mm. uh, redox gradients in the environment. What is your view on self-consciousness? Do you agree with Sagan that humans are the way the universe has become or is becoming self-aware? I think, I think putting it all on humanity's shoulders is by, obviously by definition a bit anthropocentric. Um, conscious, the evolution of consciousness. I actually think there's a lot more consciousness in this world than we give credit for, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think your camera is conscious. I don't think your desk is conscious. But the Rosella in your tree over there, I'm sure it is conscious. How about Canberra? Is Canberra conscious? Well, it's conscious? a collection of... Well, that would be the same as asking, is a, is a termite nest conscious? Mm -hmm. I mean, probably its individual members might be. Maybe the nest as a whole is. I think that's interesting. I wish I hadn't raised that analogy because we get off on interesting... <laughs> we come back. Well, come, come back to that. Well, but, that, so, I'm, I'm well, all let, about divergence, you know, let, digressions. Let, 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 let's, let's, let's come back to that. <laughs> the evolution of consciousness, which I don't think... I mean, obviously, human beings are... I say obviously, right? I have no proof that you are conscious. Well, no, I, I believe I am. But nevertheless, uh, it seems likely that... Con that he or he, obviously, human, human beings, we believe are all conscious uh, uh, and consciousness too must be a continuum right so at some point in the evolution of life consciousness has appeared and it's got uh, somehow more and more the level of self-awareness probably I'm not quite co comfortable about this because I don't think we really know but still one could argue that consciousness is itself a spectrum once consciousness appears in the universe then Hume, then Sagan is obviously to a degree right insofar as if matter prior to the evolution of life was not conscious but at some point after the evolution of life living things become conscious then yes the universe is becoming conscious of itself by definition because the living things are part of the universe well if we go um, go in a time machine and let's suppose that uh, you know we create ai and it becomes really super 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 mm. intelligent and then we look at a, a bacterium and you say, oh, that's not conscious. Well, we don't but know then that. it's super, well, we, that's what we think. We say, oh, well, our consciousness is so much bigger and oh, greater. It's, presumably it's bigger, yeah. Well, uh, presumably in the future there'll be some gigantic consciousness that will look at individual human beings and say, that's not conscious. Yeah, very, one could imagine that. Seems all too plausible to me. It does. Yeah. And so that, that doesn't uh, bode well for the future of humanity then. Uh, I don't know whether it bodes well for the future of humanity. I mean, if, if you were to, if Sagan, if that kind of argument was to be consistent, it would bode well for the universe because the universe has suddenly become even mega conscious of itself, uh, working through its intermediary biological actors that have made this complicated machine that wouldn't have happened otherwise. It's then super aware of everything. But not and if you could argue self awareness that, comes with the ability to self destruct. Well, so these are not... Which it probably does. Yeah, well, it may do. Well, that does it. Are you expecting a super intelligent machine? A super intelligent machine is really super intelligent. It's probably too intelligent to destroy itself. You can, I mean, human beings are on too the verge of... Too intelligent to destroy itself. You know, 
you could argue that we're at risk of destroying ourselves because we're not intelligent enough. Well, if we are the only <laughs> species who can destroy itself, then that's obviously associated with our awareness and our big yeah, brain. Is. And so, if, um, if you so, then you just extrapolate that into the future, and then these other things are going to also be able to kill themselves. Yeah, well, by some malfunction of the system that they are in, in control principle, of. In principle, of course, yes. But you would. Um, Isn't that an answer to the Fermi paradox? Again, I, I'm, I don't think that it is, because to be a, a solution to the Femi paradox, it has to apply in every case. Okay, so let's apply it to every case. Can, can self-destruction inevitably come with self-awareness? I mean, no, I don't, this, believe, I don't believe there's anything inevitable. Is this the Frank Drake's solution to the Fermi paradox? Mm. N equals L, where L is the lifetime of the civilization, therefore they're all very short because as soon as you get a sufficiently advanced, you kill yourself. No, it's a common solution to the Fermi paradox, but it's, it's weak because you have to make it almost a law of nature. It has to apply to every, ta every time an intelligent, self-aware species appears, it's automatically going to destroy itself. You'd have to after, make it... After a certain amount yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, relatively short. I mean, thousands of years or perhaps... But yeah. Tens of thousands, but not millions, no, tens of millions. No, that's right. And I, but I think, it's, I think it's weak because it's easy. I mean, it, whenever you try and talk to anyone about the Fermi Paradox, it's always the first solution that you usually get presented with. They've all destroyed themselves. Um, and that, I don't think, is plausible if there were a lot of them. Of course, it's plausible if there'd only been a small number of them. Mm -hmm. But if there'd been a million of them, there's going to be a million technological civilizations in the history of the galaxy. There'll be some probability that they destroy themselves. That probability might be high. But unless it's 100%, there'll be some subset of civilizations mm -hmm. that are going to pass through that phase, break out into the galaxy, and we would expect to see them and we don't. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, what do you know about aliens? Well, I know nothing about aliens because we haven't discovered any yet. You're not an alien. Well, but I think we're going to be kept playing with words again. If we're going to, def we, if we're going to use the word alien in, in, the, in, the, in the use that it's normally used, then. Um, then I am not an alien, no, by definition, because the aliens would be independently evolved. You didn't come from outer space? No, I pers but it can, depends on the definition, right? According mm. to the, the person at the immigration desk at Sydney Airport, I'm an alien, right? That's why I have to have my visa checked. <laughs> so, you, so, so it depends on what we, the definition, what we're going to use. Have you ever been abducted by aliens? No, I personally have never been abducted have by aliens. Have you ever seen a UFO? No. Well, I mean, caveat. Um, have I ever seen a UFO? Yes, I have occasionally seen things in the sky that I don't know what they are. They're unidentified mm -hmm. to me personally. I think any, any astronomer or any person who spends time looking at the night sky is going to see things in the sky they don't know what so they are. So you think are. most people have seen UFOs? Well, oh. most people have seen flying objects that are unidentified to them, yes. <laughs> okay. But not that. But you shouldn't attribute that to an alien civilization. No, then. you should not, because that's an absurd leap <laughs> from seeing something that you don't know what it is to assuming it's an alien civilization is ridiculous. I think you just called a significant fraction of the American population absurd. Well, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a log clear logical fallacy. Just because you see something you don't understand doesn't mean it's an alien spaceship. Now... Okay, let me ask you to close your eyes, and I want to talk to your emotional side here. Do I have to keep my eyes closed? You do, you do. <laughs> Doesn't as, that look really as, strange depends, on the video? Well, if you can, if you can open your eyes you and still be in touch... you do this to everybody, well, <laughs> make them I'm close Did you make Marnie Hughes Warren Warrington close here? I did, I did. <laughs> okay. the, the point is, I want to talk not to the rational side of your brain, but the irrational okay, side, the emotional try. side. Yeah, we'll try. We all have those. Yeah. So let's turn off the rational side and just be an emotional soup here. And I said... What kind of aliens would you like to find? Well, that is a very interesting question. What kind of aliens would I like to find? Yeah, I mean, I would like to find, that's, I think, the kind of aliens that... I have to think. I want you to feel. I want you to feel. <laughs> well, this is very, very difficult. I mean, what do you... I want, how do I want, I want you to feel. You have emotions. Just feel. What kind of aliens would you like to find? You've seen many alien movies where your feelings are moving all over the place. Just ask your feelings. What kind of life, what kind of aliens would you So like to... Olaf Stapleton had this concept of, um, what did he call them, minded worlds. And he had, I mean, there's a lot of pessimism in um, Stapleton's work, like um, 
star maker in particular. But he did have some grounds for optimism in that some worlds, planets on which life had evolved and evolution had progressed through to intelligence, the worlds became minded worlds. And they had a, um, a deep sense of uh, their unity with the rest of the universe. And I suppose they just spent a lot of time harmlessly contemplating it. Um, I, I think if we were to find aliens in extraterrestrial civilizations in the galaxy that were the best we might hope for would be something approaching Stapleton's minded worlds. Minded worlds. I this, think that's what he called them. This is like a whole world that is conscious or something? Yeah, essentially. It's evolved up to that kind of so level. So the whole planet is a brain or something? Yeah, sort of. And now it's a state we're now the talking about. mind means about, something up here. We're talking not, about Stapleton now. We've got to be very careful. Because Stapleton did, in, in, in his other book, Last and First Men, he literally had these giant brains. I don't did they have orgasms and sex? Well, who knows? But they were certainly large biological brains. I think he's, in, in Star Maker, I think his concept of minded worlds was, yes, a bit more the idea that evolution would produce life, life would produce these individuals, the individuals would somehow kind of become a bit like the intelligent termite colony, which we fortunately didn't, didn't progress down. That, so. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so um, uh, civilizations which have um, come to have a, um, a uh, to, to, to become at peace with themselves and the universe, I suppose. It's sort of a holistic, seeing themselves as holistic. So you, your feelings inside of you are urging, are searching for a oneness with the universe. Is that what I'm to interpret that yeah, as? Yeah, I think you could say that. You can do that without a mind, can't you? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> can you, you do that without a mind? Or I could mind? say that everything that doesn't have a mind is already there. Y yes, sort of. But then the highest the challenge is kind of if you've got a mind, then you've got... Um, Why would you want to challenge it? Well, I don't know. Well, only because of the reasons you said. I mean, if you don't, right, then if you, you've got this, if you, if, you, if you only go part of the way from not being conscious at all to being like, um, let's How about say, like a super, tree? super conscious. Like a tree out there. How about a then, tree? That sounds like, it looks like it's one with the universe. Yeah, and it's not, and presumably, although we don't know, do we, but presumably it's not aware of it. No, it's probably not. Uh, and so it's is that an important part of this uh, desire? Well, I don't know. So you, you, but you are you are asking about um, you are asking about me, and unfortunately, the cross that we have to bear is that we are aware of our existence, um, and yet we're still struggling with a lot of evolutionary baggage, which often isn't helpful. And this is how we might indeed destroy ourselves, not because we're intelligent, well, because because we're not intelligent enough perhaps right so that I, I suppose what would i hope to find as i'd hope to hope that the if 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 if, te if, if, te if intelligent species are common which i do not believe they are right having said that mm -hmm. so with that caveat i actually mm -hmm. don't think they're common but if they if, if they were and we were to encounter them what would i hope to find i'd hope that they would have trans um passed through and essentially a um what we could rather um trivially call an adolescent phase. I know people, <coughs> like, people like Drake and Sagan were quite keen on this, the idea that don't worry, we're only going through an adolescent phase and <laughs> this may cause us to blow ourselves up, but if we get through it, we'll grow up eventually. I kind of think that's what Stapleton had in mind with his minded worlds, and I think that's kind of the best that one might hope for. I, is, does, did you just say that the more self-aware you are, the better? You want to find the most self-aware things? More? Yeah, I think it probably... Well, the reason again, I'm asking this is because when I go to a party and I see people who have the most self-conscious, or the most self-conscious, they're the ones who don't know how to have fun, they don't know how to dance, and they worry about what they look like, and it's just like a, just a tremendous self-referential <laughs> wallpaper that does them no good at all. So, but many people think self-awareness is a good thing, so I just gave a counterexample to that. So... No, but I think you're right. Self-awareness on its own needn't be a good thing, right? Self-awareness among conscious entities can be a bad thing because it can and does lead to tribalistic identities, which when combined with things like nuclear weapons can be extremely uh, um, uh, dangerous. So, 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 but the hope, that the, the, the hope would be that we're not going to stop there. Right? The so idea this minded is, planet that you talked about is the thing that you wanted to have 
that would not be identifying with the group of minded planets against this other group of minded planets. I think, I think, I think, I think not, because they would. The the idea is that they would kind of, although they'd have distinct biological histories, they'd have all got to the same. I'm going to have to. Oh, mindfulness convergence. Yes, I'm going to have to use this strange and leading expression of enlightenment. I enlightenment. Think. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think I think Stapleton himself probably. I don't know whether he used that term, um, where they would see see themselves as integral parts of. Can we then build the obelisks universe. and put them on planets where chimpanzees can then turn into human beings, like in two thousand and one, and that would be part of our enlightenment to to take all the other. So these are these are. I mean, these are. Uh, so we're go, we're going off track here. You asked me sort of emotionally, what would I what mm. would I hope to find? So I kind of emotionally try, try, off track try, all try, the time. Try to give a bit of an answer. <laughs> well, what, once you start talking about whether advanced civilizations um, would feel ethically and morally obliged to interfere in the affairs of less uh, less less um, highly evolved highly evolved uh, creatures let's say um then we're kind of back oh, well, into let me the stop you use the word highly evolved i can't let that go by so universe. what do you mean by highly yeah, evolved yeah i don't know well, I'll, I'll retract it i think because <laughs> you know i'd push you in <laughs> like a bull into the corner like what do you mean by that because a lot of people do that and they still do today they talk about primitive and advanced even in the origin of species, Darwin talked about primitive things. Yes. And, uh, and I get, the only thing I can think of is that primitive means not like us. And the less like us it is, the, the more primitive it is, the more like us we call it advanced. So that's kind of like self-aggrandizing, one-dimensional scale. But you kind of alluded to it yourself when you suggested mm, these, these super-duper-minded worlds might sort of find a, a non-minded world and try and uplift it into, a, right, into right, their right, own right. state. Right, right, right. Um, and, 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 but there we're kind of in the... We're, I mean, that's a very interesting and legitimate question, right? It could, for all we know, that could be going on in the universe. Well, that was what 2001 was about. <laughs> Which so is what 2001 was and about. And that's what the Sistine Chapel is about, I guess, right? So, well, I, I, arguably, yes. So we... Uh, so... I mean, one, you want us to accept that if, 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 if technological civilizations have evolved elsewhere in the universe, and for whatever reason they've had more time or they, their evolution to that, their exalted status has been faster, they're likely to have, cap let's say not, not necessarily more advanced, but they will have capabilities uh, that we don't have. And this would enable them, and would have enabled them, had they wished, to interfere, intervene in the evolution of life on other planets that they came across. Uh, and so it must be possible, in principle. Now, but I, but I think, in part, it's because we have no evidence that, that we've been interfered with in this way. It's part of the reason, I think, actually, there aren't very many... There aren't many of these technological civilizations elsewhere in the universe, because if there were a lot of them, we might expect to have been interfered with. Now, a lot of people in the world are religious, and you didn't mention the supernatural or, or God in any of what you've said so far. Do you think this idea of cosmic perspectives, which you think are very important, is that a substitute for religion in some way? Yes. And is that because you think everybody who has given up on supernatural explanations for their own existence should move over to natural explanations and be scientists? Well, I don't think people should necessarily be scientists. Oh. But I think it would be, I think it is desirable for worldviews to develop which are consistent with our current best understanding of the universe. Uh, and so you think we can tolerate a meaningless universe? Can we tolerate a meaningless universe? Well, I think we might have to. I mean, that, but that's a slightly deeper question. I don't know Question. if any life has been able to do that so far. Every, every life form has been selected to think that it's the very important and so the meaning is built into its bias. Yeah, well, and I think... If, I, you use, if you use our brain to undo the bias, then what's the purpose? We have no meaning left anymore, and so we kill ourselves. Uh, right, well, I don't think I necessarily follow all of that. Um, <laughs> Right. I think I think it is true that we well, have to. The point we, is, if we, you if you objectively we're study have to find our own your need. brain and find out, oh, by the way, I've been selected to think I am important. That seems to be an objective way to undermine your own importance and then suicide. Why does suicide follow? Because all life on Earth has a feature 
does things to make sure it stays in existence, and that's a form of architectural meaning built into what a Darwinian selection, uh, natural selection, selects for. It is what Darwin selection Now, is. if you use your brain to say, oh, I've been selected to have a bias in my favor, but that's just something that's a bias rather than the, anything that's true, then you're using science to undo meaning. A lot of people would say that, I think. Okay, well, I don't necessarily... Firstly, I don't accept that just because you are suddenly find you no meaning, you have to kill yourself. I don't think, I don't think that follows. <laughs> but secondly, I, think, I, don't, I don't think it's true that the scientific worldview undermines meaning. Right? I think that, and this, this is where I do think people like David Christian, who I believe you've also interviewed, <laughs> uh, I think he's on, on to something quite important. It, it is important that people have a worldview, an origin story, that enables them to orientate themselves and their But is it relevance important that they play an important role in that story? Well, I don't... The, the, this, is common, this is common to all stories, right? Where is the important role played in... The hero. Sorry? The hero is the important role, the heroine, right? The, yes, yeah. that's right. But for, I mean, most, most origin stories, the, I mean, the average person might wish they were the hero, but in fact, they're not. So oh, well, wait, wait. In, origin in either, stories in always story. has a hero. The God created man to be man's image and then this created. And everybody has the people, their people, as the center of their origin story. There's no such thing as an origin story for just matter that doesn't... No, but this is where, this is where big history, I think, can make a contribution. Because it provides an origin story that is common to it all of us. It puts meaning into the and scientific it, well, world? Well, we have to find our own meaning, but it provides a, it provides a common frame of reference because it provides a common um, history of the universe, including our, the place of human beings within it, um, that is consistent with our current, under, current understanding, scientific understanding, and which we all share. So I do think it would be desirable if more people uh, had this worldview than subscribing to lots of individual um, uh, and disconnected religious worldviews, which are mutually inconsistent but with wait, each wait, other. But all those, all those individual religious views have give a much larger role to mankind than the scientific one. Yeah, they do, they? but they're, they're, they're well, that wrong. Means well, yeah, but if that wrong, that takes away a lot of the meaning that people are looking for when they have a. Religion. So I think this is kind of part of the growing up argument again, right? We just got to, uh, we just grow got up to even get further. Through. Yeah, essentially, yes, we've got to get just get through thinking that we're the uh, apple of God's eye because we're just okay. not. So. All right, but there's a problem with this point of view, and that is, there's a statement I resonates in my head. It's called, "You cannot have a view except from a viewpoint." which essentially means there's no such thing as an objective viewpoint. You always will have an evolved, some, you always be, will be an evolved something or other that has this history and therefore this bias towards your viewpoint, your view, or your viewpoint. You have to have a viewpoint in order okay. to have a view. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and that scientists kind of forget that and they just think of pure truth and not, not associated with the history of the, the evolution of the viewpoint. And this is also a little bit like the anthropic principle people talk about. They want to... In science, there's a big controversy between people who think the anthropic principle is a useful selection criteria, and the other people says, "No, that's just getting, that's just, in, that's just in injecting an element of subjectivity that doesn't, be, shouldn't be there because our particular history has no place in the objective understanding of the universe." Yeah, sorry, was that a question? <laughs> no, yeah, that's a, the question is what. Well, no, I guess the question is when we have a scientific story of ourselves or of the universe, uh, it seems to me that that will provide less of a meaning, a, a hero, less of an identity. Hey, your human beings are important. It says human beings are an element in it, but not the element. And almost the universal feature of human uh, religious stories, creation myths so far has been you are the element. You're the reason why this was done, this was done. It's all pure teleological. You take out the teleology and then, hey, it's just, that's the way it is, that's the way it is, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And that seems to take out probably the most important ingredient of religious origin stories. So, I mean, I don't disagree with that, but it's still, uh, I think it, what, what one can hope for is that gradually we can try and 
uh, a greater fraction of people will start to subscribe to a scientific origin story, a, aka Overcome big our history. Need for meaning. Um, yeah, but I think it can provide. I mean, yes, in a sense, a naive origin story, a religious origin story. Yeah, it provides meaning naively. God said, there's, God, God said, let there be light. God created you, the whole thing, and therefore you're important. But it's all just an assertion. <laughs> the religious texts say this, they assert this, and mm. people go off and believe it because mm. they want to believe it. Well, have to have to grow out, grow out of that at some point. Um, but it, but even even the even the big historical view. I mean, you're right. Yes, humans play a much smaller part in that story, in terms of the temporal perspective, because we've only been here for such a tiny fraction. But you can still anthropomorphize it a little bit because you can still argue that come, come we're going to go back around in circles here. But complexity has been increasing as a function of time, and here we are, human beings, and we're the most arguably right. the most complicated. Wait, so thing. I'm going to accuse so, so you, you of you can, inserting you can still, in a human bias can, by no, saying no, no. Okay. But you can still, if you if you want a meaning for human existence within a scientific origin story, you can still find it in that we're still kind of, as far as we know at the moment, at a pinnacle um, in terms of pinnacle of our, our complexity or capability or potential. Um, and so you can still see, even within a, a, a scientifically informed origin story, taking God out of it, mm -hmm. just looking at the evolution of the universe in a materialistic way, you can still find a viewpoint, if you want one, that has, has, that has humans at a, at a pinnacle. Is that why you do it? Well, I personally have come to a big history rather late in life. Uh, since discovering it, I, um, I think, uh, yeah, it is. It is what interests me about it, yes. The, the, the role played by increasing complexity because you identify with that increasing complexity. No, I think the thing that attracts me to it personally is the recognition that this is the as true an origin story as modern science can make it, right? A lot of caveats, there are still lots of things modern science doesn't know and still part, probably a lot of parts of this story that modern science has got wrong. But nevertheless, as far as modern science can make it, this is, this is as true a story as we can make it, and it is the crucial thing is it is common to all of us. By that, I mean inhabitants of planet Earth. We've all got the same evolutionary history. And what interests me about that is its potential to um, bring divergent cultures, which are usually told they're uh, completely separate. They've got completely different religious worldviews. They've got different gods. Their different gods made them special, but they're different. And that, that, that obviously breeds an, an, an antagonism between these different okay. communities in a way that once you recognize that we've all got a common history, then it's a cosmopolitan uh, perspective, and that's um, that's what attracts me to it. When you say we all, who's the we? Well, it's we at all levels. Certainly, it's all human beings. We but, but then all, but all life on Earth. Uh, well, indeed, when you go back, to the, right, all life on Earth has a common history, right? Because we live on a planet with the same everything. We we all share a common history of the entire universe, up until our own little evolutionary branching point, right? So all life on all life on Earth shares the same history of the universe from the Big Bang to 4.5 billion years ago. All human beings share the same history from the Big Bang to, I don't know, 200,000 years ago. And, and so this is the perspective. In a book next to your right shoulder, there's things called major transitions. Oh, yeah. The evolution, major transitions in the evolution of life. And uh, interestingly... Is that, is that the Duve? No, no, no. That's uh, Sumari, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, Smith yeah, yeah, and Sumari. Yeah, 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 okay. So uh, the idea there is they look at this phylogenetic tree of life and then they see here we are and then they trace the transitions along the lineage that led to us. And now any one of those lineages could have been picked and then to trace the evolution yeah, yeah. along that lineage. And they're all slightly different. And uh, but, of course, since we're human beings, we're most interested in the one that led to us. Yeah. But if we're trying to be scientific about it, it says, well, wait a minute, let's not look at just ours. Let's look at, we, we're capable of understanding not only our lineage, but all these lineages. Yes. And that democratizes the lineages, makes it more an objective understanding of the evolution of life. Yes. And, uh, but in that book, they talk about the major ones, not... Not the major ones led to us, that the major ones, as if there's some objectivity to the things that led to us. And they share your view about increasing complexity, 
because they define complexity as the endpoint of we're at the endpoint. So it's kind of like a little game we're playing and saying, whatever it is, we're the best, and so it's the evolution towards us. And that's the type of thing that you, I think you and I share. We're trying to get that out of science, and so it's important to try to evaluate seriously whether this increasing complexity makes any sense at all, since that's the star of the show, if it's supposed to, the scientific worldview is supposed to give us meaning. Yes, I think expressed that way, if, I mean, the scientific worldview is what it is, the history of the universe is what it is, and if as complicated, intelligent creatures who've evolved as a consequence through this story, we still want to give ourselves meaning, then yeah, we would point to complexity because we see ourselves as the most complex. If you were a, um, if you were a, a tree or something, you'd be most interested in mm, which is the most efficient photosynthesizer and not be at all interested in anything that doesn't photosynthesize. You'd just be interested in it. <laughs> well, the most religious people I know who believe in God point to this complexity, increasing complexity, and say, God is making us drive towards increasing complexity because the scientists are flummoxed about trying to understand why would you get increasing complexity? But Darwinism doesn't predict that. There's no right. reason why it should, and yet that's what it's there, and therefore therefore, God is doing this. Yeah, but I think that's, Can you push back on that? Yeah, I think that's demonstrably wrong. I don't think you need... But science the, can't... There's nothing about the second law. As a matter of fact, the second no, law pushed in the no, opposite direction. No, but I think, I think there is, and I think... Um, so we can't allude to our expanding worldviews meeting because your viewers wouldn't have seen it, so you'll have to edit this out. But uh, John Stewart, in his talk there, and in some of his papers, he's the guy from Melbourne who works in Brussels and the other way around, um, and he's written a number of very interesting papers on the rise of complexity, and, and indeed his whole book. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of other people have, who've thought about this. I think increasing complexity is inevitable um, in a Darwinian, in a world evolving through natural selection. And this is the kind of argument that Stuart and others... It's, this, it's certainly not original with Is Stuart. this a scientific law or something? No, but it's, it's like a kind of statistical law. No, no, so, so forget, forget, for, forget, forget entropy, right? We're, take, we're taking the rest of the universe for granted. There's a big entropy sink out there and we're just relying on it, right? So, but, so we're just talking about local, local, local evolution that sort of is relying on dumping its energy into the wider world for the time being. You start off with self-replicating entities, and it's this, you'll be, you'll be familiar with it, it's this left wall. You have a, you have a diagram with a wall, and you have um, time going up and complexity going this way, however you define it. Life, as it first evolves, is probably not very complicated at the beginning. So at the beginning of the, the, the time axis at the bottom, uh, there's some point. That it's really a continuum, as we've discussed, right? So, but anyway, imagine the first life form. It's not very simple. It's at the not, origin not, of these coordinates, the and then it keeps, then it keeps replicating, replicating. Right? And most, of, most of the life forms it's going to replicate are also very simple, as we know, because we look around the world today, and so, most life forms so much are like still the bacteria. So much like the electromagnetic spectrum, you're putting a one parameter yeah, thing no, in there. We can measure no, wavelength. No, no, but we cannot no, no. measure complexity. Well, okay, You're well, assuming there's a one dimensionality. I, 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 am, I am assuming there's, well, it's a two dimensional diagram because you've got complexity versus time. Okay, all right. Th through this, uh, through this, complexity through this. Complexity is one dimension yeah, in that yeah, diagram. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, for the sake of simplicity. Now, throughout the whole of evolution, most life on Earth, most life has remained simple. I mean, so damn complicated, really, but most life has remained unicellular and therefore relatively simple. Well, let me stop you there Relative. because I've argued many, many times that unicellular life is more complicated than you are. For yeah, okay. Well, that's why because it has a okay. much larger gene pool of access so, to. It can do many, I, many, yeah, many things indeed. that your monoculture cannot do. Uh, Just because you're morphologically complex and have this very I'm, simple and reduced metabolism does not I'm, make you complex in all ways. I'm happy to accept that. Absolutely happy to accept all of that. The point is. Self-replicating simple systems, they're kind of unstable against evolving complexity because complexity is permitted. If right? that were the case, then there'd be many lineages then, in the tree of life which would have also created 
macroscopic things. Well, they're all. When, no, they're not. There's just one. Uh, the eukaryotes, the, oh, well, okay, the most right. complicated, are just one tiny branch of a tiny, tiny oh, prince, on, the tree on. of life. And every other branch is happily going along being prokaryotic. That's true. But it's and they're, it they're not it trying to be complex. No, no, it's true, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, in fact, in, in a sense, it just, it just strengthens the argument. So that, that's true, right? But then the, the essence of evolution is Darwin's phrase, descent with modification, or Joyce's phrase, replicating systems, everyone, mm -hmm. Darwin, right? In, in, if, if life is defined this way as a self-replicating system which, def, which um, uh, can replicate itself but with random changes, which are then selected for by the environment, some of these random changes will be more complex, i.e., to okay, a divide. No, 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 no. So, okay. Some will survive and some yeah, won't. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. No, 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 that, that, no. That's the next stage, right? So, you, so, so, so you, you've got these uni single cells self-replicating, right? Then once, once in a while, single cell when it when it when it divides, the two cells stick together, well, right? We, you've got you've got one plausible origin for multicellularity. Mm -hmm. If if that's if that's if the if the fact that two cells haven't separated is um, detrimental, then, then it won't happen again, that become extinct. But eventually, life's continually exploring this parameter space. It's finding, what, find, finding ways of having mm, cells stick together that actually aid survival instead of impede it, and so they'll be selected well, that's what for. Bacteria, you're talking about bacterial right. yeah, Well, uh, here, here, yes, ultimately, somewhere, somewhere back at the origin of multicellularity, something like this has been going on. The vast majority of life, yes, stays perfectly happy, perfectly adapted, single cells, but and, that, and that's the left wall of the diagram, right? You've got you've got complexity I versus time. The left wall was death. No, no, I don't think so. I think the, the left wall of the, the, this di of the, di the diagram of um, of um, of uh, simplicity, uh, complexity. Yeah, time time is vertical right, in the geological sense. Okay, so you and imagine, what's the imagine time uh, complexity or some some something. So animal, you have right? a wall. Uh, on the left hand side, on the ground, because that's the minimum complexity. Where's viruses? Is it well, left? around there, right? Around it, doesn't, it, doesn't, there. it doesn't really matter. You're, okay, you're, where's let, one gene? So, so let's let's focus in. Let's focus in on that later. <laughs> <laughs> so we start start with a simple proposition that it's, it's, it's wrong because because we know the origin of life has been a continuum. Yeah. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume there is some minimum complexity that uh, above which something cannot be alive unless it's at least as complex as this. This defines the origin of this coordinate system. That is the left wall. As time progresses, most things stay close to the left wall because they're quite happy being single-celled, and so they go for four billion no, no, years. But, but, but then, yeah. the, unfortunately, the rest of this axis, the, the, the complexity axis isn't constrained. Provided what life bubbling away over yeah. here can occasionally right, can occasionally evolve a, the a greater the complexity, and then, make that then, one dimension turned into n dimensions. Well, uh, we, you don't have to. That's confusing. <laughs> all, all I'm trying to say here is because you've got a vast probability space over here of possible ways in which life can organise itself, which are both complex and confer survival ability, mm -hmm. eventually, over time, this part of the diagram will become populated. You certainly don't need God to drive it. I don't think you need anything to drive no. it except natural selection. I think it's inherent in natural selection as an evolutionary process that you're going to, complexity is going to increase. Okay, so let me repeat that. So repeat that sentence. You think it's inherent that in an evolutionary pro process that complexity increases? Yes. No. Not that all life increases did, complexity. Did Darwin think that? I don't know. Well, my bio, you know, Michael Ruse, who's a historian of, of biology, tells me that that's not the case. That that that, that is not generally accepted by biologists. Hmm. Well, I don't know. But you, you're right that Stephen Jay Gould, on the other hand, is one who created this minimal wall thing. So the book I'm thinking of, though, is not Gould. It's um, and it isn't even Stewart, John Stewart, who whose is it? paper I referred you to you met the other day. Um, the book I'm thinking of, I can't remember the authors, but they, the book has a provocative title. It's called Biology's First Law. Yes, that's McShea. Yeah, that's, that's McShea. It's that's their book. McShea, yes, so yes. They, it's there who spent McShea. I know that. Who spent that. time sort of developing this argument. I know and that. I am convinced by this argument. Okay, I'm and, not and, and, and the reason I'm, I, 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 I do see it 
as almost a stability argument. Do you have a pencil? Uh, well, you try to use words. Try to use words. Try to <laughs> well, use words. We, we're on video so, and so and right. Audio. So it's like if you you can't stand the pencil on its end. I mean, theoretically, you could stand the pencil up, and if no force is acting on it, it'll stay. Versus. But it takes such an infinitesimal force to knock it out of equilibrium, it's going to fall down. And so the, a pencil balancing on its point is said to be unstable. So I oh, think it is unstable, even quantum mechanics. Yeah. So I, I think uh, uh, you can view self-replicating systems as unstable against the mm -hmm. formation of complexity because it's not forbidden okay. and because some forms of it will be beneficial mm -hmm. natural selection is going to have okay. positive feedback is going to push some form not all the vast majority will stay simple mm -hmm. but some fraction of self-replicating systems are going to start tipping over so to become more and more complicated. So you're a McShayan then? Well, I only discovered McShay's um, work relatively recently, but mm -hmm. having read his book, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's unique to him. I, I, really would ref I really would encourage everyone to read John Stewart's papers. I think they're mm -hmm. quite profound. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're, they're not, nonetheless, they are arguing, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he must be aware of McShay's work, they are relying on this kind of argument mm -hmm. that, that once you've got self-replicating systems, there's a whole empty parameter space of complexity, and eventually these replicating systems are going to discover some of it. Well, he, he he's even goes beyond that, McShay, and he thinks, I, I parody his argument by saying, suppose that there's a white a fence in front of a house, and I think he uses this. He does. Did he, he get it from you? That's in no, his no, book. No, 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 <laughs> this is him. He says he's got a fence, and he paints it white, and then with time, you know, yeah, he gets all this complexity, and it flakes brown off, spots and, and, it's a, and he calls that, instead of saying that's the increase of entropy, yes. he calls that an increase of complexity. Yeah. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? A fence that's painted yeah, is low entropy, and then as it flex, 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 it gets, that's higher entropy. That's not complexity. Yes. That's kind of like the argument with the random number, of completely random yeah. number with no meaning is the most complex, complicated yes. thing is algorithmic complexity. So, so yeah, you're right. This is it's a, the, the, fence, the fence is a poor analogy, but I don't... That's his analogy. And I know it's his analogy, but I don't think it violates... I don't think it invalidates his entire argument, the fact he's chosen a poor so analogy. So you think a white fence that has... No, I don't think a white... out in the UV no, radiation gets more complicated... No, no, I do not. I do not. I, do, I just okay. said I thought the fence was a poor analogy. <laughs> okay. All right, very good. All right, now... What? I do think, just for, just for the avoidance of doubt, okay. I do think that if you have a some planet X and on it you put some self-replicating replicators that can only just replicate themselves but have in, but have a heritable characteristics mm -hmm. and then in which natural selection operates, you come back after a billion years, you're going to find that most of them are still simple replicators, mm -hmm. but some of them have gone off on much more complicated tangents. Like memes. Uh, yes, arguably. I mean, I really don't want to get into memes okay. because they're a completely different kettle of fish, memes. Well, I, I don't think so. I, think I, I, was, like, I was thinking purely in terms of like physical I know replicators in that I context. Know but but the information is the important part that's doing uh, all these magic of life. Yes. And so that means memes as far as I can see. Yes, okay. Anyway, what do you think are the, your students or the public's biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? Um, I think there's a range of answers to that. And again, it depends. I mean, the students would be different from the general public, I hope, because they've come through some science education and they're already wanting to know whether by we do we okay, mean, let's go with the public do we mean first. life. Let's do, do the mean, public first. I think if you ask uh, the general public, are we alone? They're, they're, yeah, they are thinking of aliens. They're thinking of uh, other other civilizations, social, large, complicated social creatures with civilizations driving around in spaceships. I mean, this is what they... Hominoids. Probably. I mean, again, I don't think you can generalize the general public. There'll be a range of... you know, Many people have been brought up on science fiction and they're reptilians. all hominoids then because the actors have to be hominoids. The greys yeah. or reptilians. I, I, yeah, I think, I think there is... Um, yeah, perhaps this is the, the biggest misconception I have come across. Is that yes? If, even if they're not hominids or hominins, then there'll be some other terrestrial life form that we're familiar with. There'll be intelligent dinosaurs or intelligent dolphins or something. Uh, whereas, in fact, of course, all of these examples are just chosen from Earth's evolution and, and the evolution of a completely separate planet. So you think dolphins off. are not intelligent? Dinosaurs are not intelligent? No, no, no. I'm just I, no. Both, both are different, different levels. I'm sure, but uh, that, that wasn't kind of what I meant. I think I, I, there's a sense that you talk about. Aliens, 
first, the people naturally will think of hominins or you know people that look like us. That's obviously very naive. If you get beyond the um, thinking that the people will be bipedal hominids, so the aliens will be bipedal hominids, then they're going to look something like reptiles, or they're going to look something like octopuses, or they're going. And 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 the fallacy here, of course, is that all we've all they've all you've done is you've taken other examples of Earth life and assumed that extraterrestrial life would be sim I mean, just assuming vertebrates, it would be astonishing if extraterrestrial intelligences were vertebrates. You look at the history of vertebrates, you've got to go all the way to the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion, and if, you've, if you, um, as Gould argues in his book, and I suspect he's right, that, um, what was that, that early, early, early chordate that gets uh, talked about, Picaea or something, mm -hmm. uh, right, from which all later chordates and vertebrates are derived. Uh, chances are, if you had an independent evolution on some other planet, maybe um, multicellular directions may not have gone through anything like even a chordate stage. So, so you won't have you won't have intelligent you won't have intelligent dinosaurs or reptiles or monkeys or hominids because that's a phylum that's evolved on on Earth. It doesn't follow that you'd have a similar phylum, something different, but functionally equivalent. You know, maybe. So so I think if you ask me what I thought the misconception was, it's kind of a, at heart. I think many people assume that evolution on other planets even up to forming intelligent civilizations would closely parallel what it's done on the Earth. And there's no, there are no real grounds for thinking that. You used the word functionally equivalent. Oh, yeah, I borrowed that from you earlier. Oh, can, you, can we quantify that <laughs> no. as scientists? Well, I don't know, maybe. Okay, and uh, so you're saying a Doctor Who, we shouldn't expect Doctor Who out there. Are you what, a, a Time Lord that can reincarnate He's an alien, itself? Right? He's um, an alien. Yes. And he looks like a human being. Yes. I think we should not e expect aliens to look like human beings, okay. with a single caveat, unless something really strange has been going on and... They can imitate us. Right? Yes, or something. Kind of like, or they've interfered okay. with our own... So if that's the public, what about students' misconceptions? I don't know, there's a whole a range of... I mean, I get a, like yourself, there would be infinite range of student opinions. <laughs> I don't, I don't think range. you can generalise. An think infinite range? I don't Certainly think you, can, they can put them in categories. Yeah, I don't think I can generalise. Well, you've had quite a few students who have thought yeah, about this question. Yeah, I have a lot of people to take my astrobiology And some course. of them uh, have misconceptions, don't you think? Yes. And what are they? It's kind of insidious to sort of pick on different individuals' misconceptions. I, I think there is a lack of understanding amongst many of my students of the, bio the history of biological evolution on the Earth. So things that knowledge that we kind of think we now know that mitochondria in the symbionts and all of this, I find this lacking as background knowledge. I mean, I would say there's a, a, a range of background knowledge, a, a wide range of different background knowledge rather than a range of misconceptions, I think, in students. I think that's the fairer way to look at it. Um, I, w I would say if you teach astrobiology, as you will know, astrobiology is an interdisciplinary topic. It's of wide interest to students, but this means that students come in from a wide range of backgrounds. So in my astrobiology class, I have geologists doing it, I have astronomers doing it, I have biologists doing it. And they all come in with their own baggage and their own knowledge, much of which is relevant, but it's only a subset. And so the task is to to weave all of these things together. So the challenge from an educational point of view in an astrobiology class is that you have students come in with a wide range of background knowledge, right? And it's, and it's different. So in my class, I have people doing geology, I mean, who are majoring in mm -hmm. geology, astronomy, biology. And so they come in with a lot of knowledge in their own subdiscipline, but very little knowledge about anything else. So the astronomers in the class will know nothing about mitochondria or even even what the genetic code is or how it works. Whereas the, geology, the biologists in the class will know all about that, but they don't know anything about stellar evolution. They don't know what the main sequence is. They don't know what a red giant is. And so the challenge from an educational point of view is you've got to try and bring people with wide range of different, in, among students, wide range of different knowledge up to a sort of common level. Uh, but that's what gives astrobiology its um, strength, I think, or is it, that's what's interesting about it as an academic discipline, is it? Hopefully it's turning out broad-minded interdisciplinary scientists. And uh, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Yes. 
Yes, I would go for it. If, if, you're, if you're interested in, if you're interested in, I, my, my stress to all students, whether they want to be astrobiologists or not, uh, whatever they're interested in, my advice to students is always to follow their dreams or their gut instinct about what they really want to do. Um, and if they really want to be astrobiologists, then they should go for it. And my second level of advice is that astrobiology is such a broad church that you're probably going to find it helpful to be a specialist in one area of it. So having argued for interdisciplinarity, if you're then going to want to move on to do a uh, postdoc or a PhD or something, you probably are going to want to have a, identify a subset of astrobiology in which you can become a relative expert while at the same time maintaining a good general understanding of all the other areas. And are we alone in the universe? We do not know whether we are alone in the universe. What do you think? Any, any intuition? I think uh, my thinking really has evolved over the decades. Uh, my thinking now is I honestly do not know. I think it is important to find out. I think we will find out within the coming probably 50 years whether, whether at least simple life is common in the universe or not. But I think, I, think, I think we have to, I think having a belief in this is not helpful. It's an empirical problem and we have to get out, we don't know, and to solve it we have to get out into the universe and look.